Do you want more control over your life? More freedom? More confidence? Do you want to set your own rules and steer your own ship? Are you sick and tired of the 9 to 5 grind that's eating away at you and robbing you of all your time, barely getting you by? How about a new way? A new side hustle, side income you can use now to do things like pay off debt, buy a new car, wipe away credit card bills and student loans, remodel your home, take exotic vacations, fancier dates, buy your friends a round of drinks, send a nice gift to your family. How about an emergency fund or even a down payment for a house? And so much more. Welcome to the Flipping Ninja Podcast, where we teach you how to take charge of your life and make your own money flipping things on your spare time. Sound complicated? We'll cover it all, from what to buy, where to look, marketing, and selling tactics that create demand and bring you top dollar, research, pricing, creating ads that sell like crazy, and even powerful principles on the inner game of success. So if the idea of being your own boss is exciting, you're in the right place. Now, here's your host, the world's leading authority on flipping, AJ from theflippingninja.com, unplugged and unleashed. Hey guys, welcome to today's show. This is AJ, The Flipping Ninja. Just wanted to give you a quick intro on what this uh, uh, today's show is going to be about. So this is a, this is an interview. I'm interviewing one of my friends, Carolyn, who she actually uh, has experience in refinishing furniture and selling it for a profit. So it's going to be a very informative uh, podcast for you. So if you're someone who's been thinking about uh, refinishing furniture and selling it or you know, just want to know about it. I know I've done it a couple of times myself and it's been super profitable. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, refinishing furniture. I'm not like really skilled or anything either. I'm actually really bad at it. So a lot of times if I am refinishing, you know, like a little table or a dresser or something, I'm just constantly there in my garage, just Googling every little thing and watching YouTube videos. So I'm not really good at refinishing furniture. I have done it. And the very few times I have done it, oh my God, it's ridiculous how much money you can make uh, as a buyer and reseller um, and as a flipper who refinishes furniture. I mean, you know, a lot of times, I mean, there was this one uh, a long uh, side table I bought once, right? It was just like a console table. So it was like a long, narrow little uh, table that I bought for, I think it was like 10 or $15 at a thrift store. All I did, all, I literally just took it home and I didn't even refinish it. I mean, it was a solid wood table. I didn't even refinish it. All I did was I put it in my garage. I just cleaned it with a wet rag, you know, let it dry. And I just spray painted it. I literally just spray painted this uh, this table that I bought. I spray painted it black, the whole thing. I just bought some spray, uh, some spray paint bottles, which it's super fun to do. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of refinishing furniture, but I love spray painting stuff, right? And it's super fun just uh, spray painting furniture. And it's easy and it's like makes a huge difference right away. It's not like a ton of work. So all I did was I literally just spray painted this table black and then I posted it up for sale. You know, I took pictures. I posted it up for sale. That little table sold for $150. I was shocked. I was like, oh, my God. You know, so, you know, refinishing furniture can be an extremely profitable and lucrative niche if that's something you're into or if that's something you want to get into so this interview i'm uh, i'm interviewing carolyn who she that's what she does so she was nice enough to come on and give us some of her insights on uh some of the things that she does so the beginning of the audio was kind of weird we thought it was recording but it wasn't, but um, yeah, like I said, it's going to start and, you know, take notes if you have to uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Uh, leave a question. Um, and yeah, so here it goes. Okay. I think it's recording our call. So. Oh, okay. I'll be talking about refinishing furniture. So hunting for furniture on Craigslist and deciding if it's worth purchasing, and then if you get it, if you want to improve it, what you do. Okay, have you refinished, what what kinds of things have you like refinished in the past? Or like bought, yeah, fixed absolutely. up, and resold? Have you like resold anything? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, actually got a table for free, and it was an Ikea table, um, just one of their classic like wood ones. It had white table legs, a one pull-out drawer, and then it had a wood top made of pine. 
but the uh, they put this like wax substance on it, and it was kind of damaged from water. It just didn't look good, which is why they were giving it away. But I completely flipped the table by sanding the entire thing down to the wood grain again. I stained it this beautiful color. I painted the legs, and I got new um, uh, handles for the drawer poles. And I ended up selling it. I think I sold it for one hundred and seventy-five dollars. And you got um, uh, you got it for free. You said. Yeah, I got it for free. Okay. Yeah. See, that's like that's the thing. I I don't like. I'm not a huge fan of refinishing, resanding, repainting, all that stuff, just because I don't really know how to do it. But not just that, because I feel like it takes forever. Is that right? Like, how well, long did it, it take you to do that? Well, that's the thing. It can take it can take a long time. So you have to be willing to invest in it. And the, actually, the reason that I got the table is because originally I wanted it for myself. So I was willing to put in the time. So if someone's going to go out and, like, look at furniture to try and uh, to refinish and flip, they're really putting an investment into a piece of furniture. Um, and they have to have the right materials. Because, for instance, I have a power sander, um, and I have the right tools to, like, strip the wood and strip the wax, and everything costs money. So if you think you're going to take over this table with a little bit of sandpaper in your hand, it, you're going to give up. You, it's not going to work. So when you decide to flip a piece of furniture, really do your research and make sure that you're, like, prepared to, um, to, to work on it by having the right tools and time. Okay, well, my like, the thing is my time is, like, really valuable to me, so I, I'm very watchful. And the thing is, when you're in a thrifting business, like when you're in, buy, in a flipping business, buying things and reselling them, yeah. you have to actually treat it like a business and not just like a side hobby. So when you're treating this thing as a business, you're tracking everything. Profits, losses, expenses, mm -hmm. and even your time. So do you feel like the time investment for buying furniture pieces and like refinishing it is worth the profits? Like how big are the profit margins versus like the time you put into it? Do you know what I mean? Give me a sense of like, like give me an example. Yeah, like sure. give me just some examples, straightforward. Yeah, sure. So, okay, I actually, first of all, I agree with you. I think from the flipper standpoint, you shouldn't refinish your furniture. Really look for items that are just like ready to get out the door, or have minimal damage to them so that they can be an easy sell. I think the only reason that you should actually refinish a piece of furniture is if A, you want it for yourself, B, you want a refinishing business, or C, you bought a piece of furniture thinking that it was good to go and then you realize that you can't sell it because, okay, something is wrong with it. Oh, so you're so, kind of um, like you're for you're put in a situation where you're kind of forced to refinish it in order for it to sell. Absolutely, yep. And yeah, I um, of that. So that, yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Because, like, for instance, I just recently got this vanity, and again, it was an item that I wanted for myself. And once I got it, I was like, hey, turns out I don't want it. So I picked up the vanity for fifty dollars. And um, it looked good, but w the stool itself was made of, like, carbon board, and it wasn't very secure. So if a larger person sat on that stool, they probably would have broken it. So I reinforced it by just, like, a couple of two-by-four pieces and then some screws in my power drill. And when I did that, it made it way sturdier and then also helped to sell because when the family came to to pick it up and I flipped it for 75 so it only made a profit of 25 on that sale not a not a ton but I didn't have a lot invested in it um the family did pick up the stool and look to see if it was reinforced so that's just an instance of like where it, when it counts to um just make a, a, a really what was what I consider a quick fix paid off in the long run okay well would you here would you recommend like something like refinishing See, I, I feel like <clears throat> something like buying furniture, refinishing it, and reselling it is, like, might be <clears throat> a favorable thing to do for, like, I don't know, like, stay-at-home moms or even stay-at-home dads. I mean, shit, if they know how to do it and they have a lot of time yeah. on their hands, I think it, it might be, and their time is not really a huge issue because, you know, like, if they're home yeah. all day anyway... It might be a, a decent thing to look at. Would you agree with that? 
absolutely. Because honestly, it's fun. And it's kind of a creative outlet where you can see this piece of furniture and you're like, I can turn that into something way better than what it currently is. Yeah, and I think, so I think you, it would be cool for like the creative mind who's passionate about that to just like mm-hmm. do it. And if somebody is like super content and happy refinishing furniture and completely like expressing their like design side through that I mean that's that's freaking awesome you know yeah absolutely 100% agree it's not going to be for everyone and it does take a lot of time but for those people who have always wanted to try start small that's all I can say is start small because then you get a realistic idea of what it takes and don't make a huge investment on your first refinishing project because if you don't follow it through, you're just going to be stuck with a half-finished piece of furniture. So, um, yeah, start small, be realistic, and give it a try if you have the time and the passion to try it. Yeah, and I think if you do have the, the knowledge, expertise, skills, and the time to do it, it can be a... You can... There is potential in it to turn it into a full-time gig. Because if we break it down time-wise and profits-wise, profits wise, let's say you buy a, I don't know, give me an example of a piece of furniture that'd be great for refinishing. A dresser. Okay, let's say you buy a beat-up dresser. I mean, this thing is beat up, but you do see potential in it. You see a lot of potential. So let's say you have your typical 9-to-5 type job. You have an 8-hour day. Mm-hmm. Let's say you make... $150 net that you take home at the end of your eight hours. Okay? Mm-hmm. And let's say you go the refinishing furniture route and flipping it. Say you buy that dresser and you have it and in eight hours you can completely turn it into that vision that you had or completely have it refinished ready to go, ready to sell. It did take you eight mm-hmm. hours, though, to resand it, add hardware, whatever it, whatever it is. It took you about eight hours, and you sold it, and you made 200 bucks on it. At that point, I think it it's a pretty, it sounds like a pretty good setup for someone who loves doing it, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because you can make a big profit. Like, for instance, um, my the table that I did... Uh, that sold for, for, I got it for free and I made like a hundred dollars off of that. And then I have this dresser that I completely redid. Um, I was obsessed with it. I worked so hard on it. I, I think I sanded for, I think like six hours straight and I'm not even joking. Um, but that thing turned out so good. I got it for $50 and I could probably flip it for 300. You know what? And I just, that just reminded me. So here's the thing. A lot of people think that... A lot of people think it takes money to make money, and that's not true at all, because you can invest other things besides money to make money. For example, Mm -hmm. your time and energy. You've got unlimited energy. You don't have, you may not have unlimited money, but you have unlimited energy, and you can invest your energy and time. So let's say you don't have much money to invest starting out, when you want to get into flipping things, but you've got a lot of energy, you can still invest your energy and monetize it. Going back to the refinishing things, if you brought home, if you go on the free section of Craigslist and get like a dresser, a bookshelf, and like a wooden chair, just all for free, you Mm -hmm. invested zero dollars into that, but now you're gonna be investing energy and time into refinishing it well, you might be investing, a, you know, a couple bucks for materials, but yeah. um, the profit, mar- you're, at that point, you're investing your energy and time in making pro- you're monetizing it. So it's not always true that it takes money to make money. It takes energy, it takes time. Those are two things you can also invest in order to make money yeah. in returns. And that's so beautiful, like literally just to my ears because starting out like I am a really creative person and it, it, I don't feel like I have a ton of money to pour into some of the larger Craigslist purchases so that was the way that I could get free stuff and do something that I liked and then flip it for actually a substantial profit and when you do that sometimes you never even know like 
what's going to come out of the woodwork because I, my table that I sold, I had posted the pictures and someone actually contacted me and said, did you refinish that yourself? And I said, I did. And then he actually emailed and said, I will pay you to refinish my furniture. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, see, that's awesome. And that's the cool part about, you know, putting yourself out there or buying and selling things or, you know, flipping things. You, opportunities just come to you that way. I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I, I never even knew that. I don't think you told me that. Did you? Oh, I don't know. That was a while ago. I thought I did. Okay. And I, yeah, the guy, like, literally, he was like, come and refinish my furniture. I'll pay you, like, good money. But I was, um, I was working, like, eight, eight plus hours a day. I was super busy. And I decided I just didn't have the time to, to donate for, like, the amount of money that he wanted to pay. But I was like, that's cool because someone likes what I did. And it just goes to show that business opportunities can come from that. And pay off, yeah. And and the crazy part is, so that guy sounds like somebody who doesn't have time but does have money. You sound yeah. like someone who has time and <clears throat> maybe not all the money you want towards the, you know, investing and in flipping things, but that's awesome because at that point you can, you know, like I'm all about, I'm all about like finding creative ways of monetizing things, just overall creative, like creativity. So if he wanted to, let's say, let's say I was the guy who didn't know how to refinish things. Like I, and I don't, cause like I suck at that stuff. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> it takes forever. I don't have the design eye. I don't have the creative eye at all, mm -hmm. nor do I want to spend the time one learning and two actually doing it. So Mm -hmm. In a case like that, I would have the money to spend and invest. And if I wanted to start a refinishing business, I would find someone like you who has the time and energy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at that I was point, say, it's I would pay you partner. for it. I would pay you for it. Let's say, let's say I, I got a free piece of furniture. Let's say I got like some awesome, like quality, like a solid bookshelf um, mm -hmm. that's made of wood that has potential um, let's say I got it for 10 bucks and let's say I paid you a hundred bucks to refinish it and you're like totally okay with that yeah you're like yeah I love doing this I would totally do that it only take me four hours to do this <clears throat> so yeah. my total investment at that point is a hundred and ten dollars hundred dollars to pay you to refinish it and ten dollars to buy it and let's say once let's say the finished product is this badass bookshelf that's like completely out of this world and unique I can potentially post that for 200 to 300 dollars and it would sell and you got paid I got paid I got a profit and the customer is happy with this badass bookshelf that they got so everyone walks home happy yeah and uh, yeah so I mean that's my mind just automatically goes to creative like situations like that. Yeah, and I love it because that's how it should be. Like, if you know someone, like you're good at getting free stuff, but you really don't know what you're doing, and you're like, oh crap, I need to fix this up. Like, you can, you can totally collab with somebody and and like start, you know, with your budget and say, I'll pay you twenty dollars if you can like just make this like stay together. And they'll be like, okay, and they just grab their nails and a hammer and get to it. And the next thing you know, you're flipping it for. 70 and you've both made a profit yeah it all comes down to how much you value how much your time is worth and that's what you have to figure out for yourself you know yeah yep absolutely truer words have never been spoken <laughs> um but yeah <laughs> refinishing stuff what else is there i can't really think of anything else anything else important I mean well there's there's a ton that like when it comes down to what you're looking at so like let's say you're looking at a chair and you want to reupholster it I would say unless you're great at sewing stay away from any reupholstery projects mm -hmm. because they are incredibly expensive oh, if you want to do a really good stuff? for the fabric oh yeah like if you if you get this like you're like this chair looks awesome and you're like oh but the it's like got this ratty old fabric on it and I'm going to rip that off and like fix it and you think oh I'm just going to take it to a reupholsterer they charge like 400 to 600 dollars well here, here's the thing about that I totally agree with you until 
So do you remember that Nathan Anthony couch I got? Yeah. So there's there's a couch that I got. It's it's a designer brand, really high end luxury couch by Nathan Anthony. They make like four mm-hmm. four thousand plus dollar couches, and then their used couches are at the fifteen hundred dollar range. So mm-hmm. I picked up this Nathan Anthony couch for forty five dollars at a thrift store. Obviously, it was in a perfect condition. It did have. It could use. It could have used like a cleaning. It could have used. Uh, I think one part of the little pillows on the seams was yeah, torn. Yeah, the cushion. Yeah, the seam was torn. So you could easily sew that part. Point is, and there's a, there's a couple like scuffs on the back of the leather, but that wasn't a giant deal. It was it was a good enough deal. It was in good enough condition, where, like, if you bought it, you would be guaranteed to make a profit either way, whether mm-hmm. it's like medium or big. But anyway. So I think, for example, like on a couch like that, like a high-end, you know, $4,000 quality couch, it might be worth it to, you know, get it re, uh, like redid. Because, for example, the buyer, it actually sold for $225. Um, but the buyer, the, the woman was looking for, that was exactly the kind of couch she was looking for. But she was even thinking of like, getting new uh, covers made for it and all that stuff. Yeah. And, basically and that's the way that to go. Process. And I think that would be probably, that wouldn't be a bad idea. That would be a good investment because you still have the same couch, but you just invested some money into making it like fresh and new again. Yeah. And, and that's what counts is like it just needs a spruce up. So like, I guess, um, yeah, so with fabric, just be thoughtful because you're totally right about that couch. I mean, you're so right. Like, you, that's such a good investment. But, like, getting a single chair that you got for, like, $20 and then you're going to spend, like, $200 to reupholster it, that's not going to – that's not a good investment. Right, right. And also um, back to the <clears> – <throat> like, re, as far as refinishing items go, if you if you buy something – that's an okay shape that could definitely increase the value by refinishing it. You don't Mm -hmm. have to refinish it. If you bought it at a low price, you can sell it at a price minus the cost of refinishing it. Like for example, you know what I mean? Like if I bought a bookshelf for 20 bucks, let's go back to that bookshelf. Was it a bookshelf for 10 bucks? Yeah, you said bookshelf. Yeah. Yeah. So that bookshelf for 10 bucks, I paid you a hundred to refinish it. It is now worth 300. Let's say I didn't pay you that 100 to refinish it, and I sold it as is. I could probably sell it for 60 bucks, as it is. Depending on the condition, you know, 10. The range between 10 dollars. The difference between 10 dollars and 60 dollars is not mm-hmm. big enough to like make a huge difference to someone. So like. You could sell, or I could sell it as is, just because I wouldn't want to deal with refinishing it for sixty bucks. Yeah. And you still made a fifty dollar profit just from acquiring the item and flipping it. Yeah, for like for instance, uh, right along that same line. Do you remember outside of your house when I pulled up and I was like, "We need that," and there was yeah. like this dresser thing that they were throwing out, and so you like a Hulk lifted that into my Jeep for me. <laughs> And I took it home, and I was like, I'm going to make this the dopest dresser ever. I was like, this is going to be a kitchen island. I was going to, like, attach cats to the bottom of it, and it was perfect. But as it sat in the garage, I was just like, okay, no, I'm just going to sell it because I'm not, I don't have the time to invest in this. And I literally posted on Craigslist, I said, I was planning on refinishing this, and I said it was either going to be a dresser or a kitchen island, and I got, like, three text messages right away and this woman was like I want this I'm going to actually refinish it it's going to turn into this like popcorn stand in our basement so just the fact that you like suggested that it doesn't have to be just what you think it is I people were crawling all over to buy that and I got it for free and I think I sold it for like 65 wow and yeah and back to the you know if we're talking an hourly rate or how much you're making for your time you basically put in probably 45 seconds of having your car parked while I put it in the back yeah. of your truck and then just, post, you know, spending maybe like 10 minutes t- 
taking pics on your phone and then just posting it up for sale and then boom. How much how much oh, did yeah, you sell that it for was again? It. I think I sold it for seventy. Yeah, I mean seventy bucks just like that. So yeah, the, the thing is, the, the deals are everywhere. I mean, whatever it is, especially like, you know, furniture pieces. And that's a good reminder. I completely, because uh, in the book, I keep talking about investing in a truck. But for, I don't know why, I completely forgot about the possibility of having a freaking, like, SUV. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, if you have an SUV, <laughs> there's still a lot of uh, um, potential. There's with a it. lot of space. Yeah. Like a ton more. Yeah. I, I totally forgot about that. I'll have to add that in there. But um Yeah, you know that uh so that baby changing table that I got. Yeah. Um, I bought it for I do you remember how much I got it for? No, I don't. Uh, I think oh it okay, it was expensive. it was forty five dollars. So so I got that was the day I got the two red living room chairs. Mm-hmm. And the baby changing table. The table was forty five bucks, and the two living room chairs were uh, seventy. So I posted the baby changing table. Well, first of all, I thought it was a freaking dresser. So this whole time I'm hey, like, y'all. <laughs> look at this poor white dresser. And I guess it can be like a dress. It could be whatever you want it to. Yeah, okay. it kind of was. It was. <laughs> if I if it if I wanted that to. To be my closet, I can make it my closet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So it was it was freaking like three things. It was a white dresser slash TV stand slash baby changing table. But the fact that it was a baby changing table is super important because at that mm-hmm. point you're opening up a complete new market out there. Yeah. You've got all these moms and like pregnant people like having babies left and right and they're free, they're constantly <laughs> looking for these things you know and today people yeah. don't want to spend I actually googled it and those go those for some reason like baby changing tables are super expensive like super yeah expensive. I'm not I'm, I, I think I saw some for like 600 bucks but anyway uh, so this this girl texts me or she emails me and she's like I want to take you know I want to I posted it for 190 and she offered 150, and I said, yeah, I, I would sell it to you for 150. And she, uh, she, she couldn't make it. She wanted it so bad. She actually sent her parents. She called her parents, and her parents, like her old parents, came and picked it up. And they were telling me they were like, yeah, she's been. They're like, yeah, these go like hotcakes. <laughs> like they're like, there's another one they're interested in for I think 200, and it sold right away. Because she was having a baby soon, and she was looking for a table. But, yeah, so at that point, it's important to recognize what the product actually is, too. Like, if I never knew it was a baby-changing table and put that those keywords in the ad, they would have, that market would probably never come across it because they're probably searching on Craigslist baby-changing table, and they're looking for, like, good deals and stuff. But, like... Yeah, it's it's crazy, and and those two red uh, living room chairs actually, like you were mentioning about the other chick who uh, was like super excited about your dre- your dresser thing, or your yeah, what was the thing we picked up? Was it, it wasn't a dresser; it was like a little island it, thing. Well, it kind of was. It was like a dress. It had three drawers, and then it had this like side piece that was like shelves. Oh, okay, gotcha. I, I yeah, still don't I know what it was. Yeah, I so <laughs> so the thing is, this lady who, so the two chairs I got, um, well, first of all, like, I'm glad I took pictures of them at the thrift store so that I could have them included. Um, yeah. But I also, like, took awesome pictures of them, like, staged in my living room. Yeah. And then I had, so you, I had you write that killer description that was, like, out of this oh, world. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, which we're going to have a sec. There's a section on that, too. But I think we should maybe have another call on descriptions and writing, like... Yeah. Because you're really good at coming up with descriptions with as far as, like, the furniture side and, like, different yeah. wood and stuff like that. But <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right, though. Like, because you're so good when it comes to, like, your technical elements. Like, you know what you're talking about. You do so good at describing, like, what something is and, like, what it's... Te- 
But yeah, I have this like soft spot for furniture and wood. So, you know. Well, like, you're just like, I, I think it has to do with the fact that like your vocabulary and your communication skills and your writing, like the way you describe some of these pieces, like, holy shit, you could turn like a regular red wooden table into this like masterpiece table with like a story behind it and like something that you just like it immediately gets people emotionally involved and that's a huge part of writing your ads is make them emotionally driven use descriptive words that really make mm -hmm. the item uh, sell you know sell the item yeah but uh make yourself want to buy it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the the red chairs what happened was this this uh woman and every now and then you get people who contact you who they don't even mention price they just come and pay you full price right on the spot mm -hmm. and those are always cool because um, they don't try to negotiate they just they want the item um, they don't like haggle or anything but anyway so the two chairs she she's like she really wanted to check them out because she wanted them for her living room and she actually brought one of the pillows from her living room because she wanted to make sure it matched oh, yeah. But as soon as she walked Mine. inside, she, uh, oh my God, she was so excited about these chairs. She just kept going on and on. She was like, oh my God, they're perfect. They're going to match my couch and they're going to, they're per like, she wouldn't stop, like, talking about them. And <laughs> it's weird because she took the chairs. She was super happy about them. But, like, I posted it for 220 and she gave me uh, 220 and then she's like, hold on. Let me go in my car. And then she gave me an extra $5. So I'm like, okay. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was, like, in love with these chairs. And, um, yeah, I think I think it's it's an awesome thing. There's nothing wrong with buying low at thrift stores or on Craigslist and reselling, basically being a middleman and reselling to people. Because look how happy she was. She wouldn't care. She wouldn't, like, she wouldn't care if she knew that I got them for 70 bucks. She wanted the chairs anyway. No. You know, she's going to pay the price yeah. anyway. She, So it's like you're kind of connecting people with, and who knows, maybe she's never been into a thrift store in her whole life. But here, you just completely hooked her up with these awesome chairs in her living room now. And she's, like, super happy with. Yeah, I love that story. Because it's just, like, it's so, it's so right. Well, first of all, I didn't know that she, like, tipped you an extra five. <laughs> That's amazing. But, like, yeah, she couldn't have cared less. Like, when people, when someone comes and they're, like, so excited, it's huge. Because, like, that's what happened with the, the family that came to pick up my vanity. It was a teen girl who was buying it. And she's like, it's perfect. Like, she was so stoked. And her grandpa was with her. And he's like, are you sure? And she's like, absolutely. Okay, and, uh, I, I have a... I have a question for you. Go ahead. You can finish, and I have, a, like, a huge question for well, you. Well, no, I was just, just going to say that they paid full price, and she was, like, so happy, and she was just, like, it just is a good feeling to sell to someone like that. Yeah, and it's it's more than just making profits off of it. It feels good, um, see, you know, helping people. You know, I, I sold a couch to a girl who got her first apartment, and she was super happy with it. You know, first apartment. Those That's like a... You're, for, you're always going to remember your first apartment, you know? Yeah, it's a big deal. So it's a big deal. The fact that you were there to help, you know, you were a part of that, and you, like, helped them up or whatever it is. But I was going to ask you, so, like, I feel like because of you, I have, I have the eye, like, the eye of the tiger when it comes to furniture. So, like, before... <laughs> If I walked into, like, a thrift store and saw, like, just some random old piece of furniture, I wouldn't even... I probably yeah. wouldn't even look at it, first of all. And second of all, I'd be like, okay, nobody's going to buy that. But now, after, like, <laughs> seeing how you look at furniture pieces and chairs and couches and all these, like, random... Like, I swear, whenever you see something that I think is completely ugly and retarded, and you, you're like, that's the best thing ever... I'm like, yeah. and then you get it, and I'm like, okay, whatever. You take it home, and it's it, it's like the best thing in the world. It looks so awesome. <laughs> so how do you, like, I feel like over time, I finally developed that ability. Like, honestly, I would say because of you, that, like, you're responsible for that white baby changing table and those red living room chairs. Yeah. I, I got the confidence to, like, 
buy those on the spot because of like your insight and knowledge in the furniture world and all that. So like what kind of yeah. tips would you give people to develop that that ability to see whether something is hot or not? I guess like the whole creative side or like the designer yeah. side. Is that something you just uh, have to you just have or don't have or can you develop it? Well, I think you can can develop it because, for instance, like, look at you. I, like, I know that you texted me when you were going to buy those things, and I was like, yes, get those. Um, so, like, you developed it on your own, but it is something that either you're, like, you just have it or you can cultivate it. So, like, look at something. Do you like how it's built? Like, do you like its lines? Um, like, is it something that maybe you would buy for your own house? And, uh... And when you start there, like, that's a good base to just be like, do I like that or do I think it's, like, ugly as sin? Um, you know, one thing and, I noticed was I feel like yeah. when you're in a, if you're in a giant thrift store with, like, a bunch of random furniture, old, like, old random furniture, um, I feel like if you live in a regular, like, normal, regular or modern apartment or place, if you take one... Mm -hmm ugly or old piece of furniture well I call it ugly because I think they're ugly I'm sure they're like not ugly to people but <laughs> I, I feel like I've learned through you if you take one of those pieces and just randomly place them somewhere in your place I think because it's surrounded by everything else it immediately stands out in a good way oh yeah absolutely you can mix and match because like so you're okay for instance like my home is decorated really comfortable and i have like this deep leather couch and then i have this like white television stand and then off to the side i have this like older oak table and the oak table isn't really it's not like the most eye-catching thing you've ever seen but because it's the older piece amongst all of these like more modern neutral comfortable pieces it just kind of like fits in and you don't get overwhelmed one way or another with one style um because some people will like get a whole bunch of one kind of item like for instance mid-century modern furniture you can walk into someone's house and you'll be like whoa did i just like go back in time to the 50s okay can you first but, can you stop for a sec what is mid set what is it mid mid-century modern mid-century modern what is that because i've used those exact terms in one of my ads for a shelf i have i have i yeah. really don't know what that means though what does that mean so mid-century modern is a type of furniture it's not just a type of furniture it's a style of furniture that was popular in the 40s 50s probably the 40s and 50s and what it is is it's very clean lines and a lot of the table legs, um, like, were skinny pegs. Okay. So you might see, like, skinny pegs. Um, and if you, like, obviously, if you want to learn more about it, all you have to do is, is literally type in mid-century modern in Google, and it'll bring up all of these furniture pieces. Okay, I so kind think, of think about, like... I think, okay, do you know that, that uh, TV stand I have in my living room? That is, I have that posted up for sale right now, and it says mid-century modern TV stand. Now, do you, do you remember the legs on that thing? Mm -hmm. The one in your living room, the dark one? Yeah, the black one. The legs are, like, silver uh -huh. and just pointy, like, pieces of, like, steel. Yes, that's mid-century modern. Okay, and then do you remember that leather L-shaped couch I had with the same yes. legs? Would that be considered that, too? I, I think that would be considered more modern furniture because the legs weren't like little pegs. They were kind okay. of more like square solid. Gotcha. Okay. So back to what you were saying. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, so like um, if you walk into someone's house and it's all one style of furniture, sometimes it can get a little bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But um, like you can, yeah, you can mix up pieces. And, and so like, I guess we'll get into this when we get more towards like description of items. Mm -hmm. But when you get something, sometimes like a furniture piece, it's good to research, like see if you can find who made it, like that's stamped onto it somewhere and research like what they specialize in because you can actually use that in your favor and put that in your description. Right, for sure. Yeah, we, we go over that in the book basically okay. about getting the specifics, immediately finding out the brand, the make, 
model, if there is a model, stuff like that. Yeah. Also, also, even when you're out and about, if you find something before you buy it and you want to see maybe how much the value is, you want to find like the, the name brand and just do a Google search on it. Or yeah. You know, like what I did was I, I found that Nathan Anthony couch. I saw, I just Googled Nathan Anthony couch and I saw a ton of them for thousands of dollars. And then what I did was I typed in Nathan Anthony couch Craigslist because at that point you can get an idea of what maybe other people all over the, uh, the nation is selling it for on Craigslist. And it was really hot. Still, it was still really high. So that way you know right away that this is a high end piece that you can make a profit on and buy it and resell it. Yeah, absolutely. And I like, I kind of feel like I could talk about this stuff all day. Like, that's how much I like it. Yeah, and uh, I was going to say one more thing, and that is, uh, yeah, I think I think um, the fact that I got, like, a lot of insight and experience from you about the furniture side of things has, first of all, made me a ton more money overall because... Mm-hmm back to like the whole filling your pipeline thing if you're just in one specific niche like yamaha keyboards for example if you don't expand if you don't expand and just exploit other markets you're limiting your you're putting a ceiling on the money you can make so it feels good to get familiar with other categories of items you know furniture couches electronics instrument musical instruments whatever it is because now i feel like specifically with furniture and stuff like i could walk into thrift stores and i i almost never walk out of a thrift store without making money like without finding a deal on a furniture piece because every almost every furniture piece you develop this ability to see you have a vision for it like with thrift stores in general or wherever you go like whether you're browsing on craigslist whenever you see something you don't just see the item you see a little dollar amount over the item and right away you can decide you're like okay that's how much I, I can probably make on that piece and then you get yeah it, you know yeah well and it's so important here because like if you think about my history with craigslist like you encouraged me like you're you're the person who got me started because i got to watch you do what you do and it, you're so good at it like you seriously have the secret to it but like you get this gigantic area rug and so that was my first sale and I made tons of money on that which was amazing and then after that I did like the GPS or I did the Garmin which again you told me to buy because right I wanted to stay in my little niche which is furniture we were like get it it's like six dollars I was scared to spend six dollars on a Garmin yeah and, you've, um, got to, you've got to have some balls to you've got to you've got to yeah. spend money and take risks to make money well, and here's the thing, like, I guess that's the thing, it totally paid off because even though it scared me, like, I now feel like I can sell anything that yeah, I can. I mean, like, it, it doesn't like, have to be furniture. Don't spend $600 on something and try, you know, no. like, like you said, like, $6 isn't going to kill you. I mean, even if you lose $6, so what? Yeah, it was $6, and I ended up selling that thing for, what, like, 50 To this, granted, the guy was a little crazy because sometimes you meet crazies on Craigslist, <laughs> but... Um, like he got it and he was so excited and the reason he bought it is because the Garmin will show you how fast you're going when you're driving and he's like oh good my speedometer just broke so this is what I'm going to use wow yeah that's that's insane I don't even remember I, I didn't even know that part of it and that's the crazy part you don't ever underestimate something like trying to post something up for sale because you might yeah the, a normal person might think GPS, oh, these are, people don't even use these anymore, like, you know, but then, I mean, think about that. You would have never thought that somebody's going to buy that <laughs> to uh, use the speedometer, you know? <laughs> no, seriously, because that's the thing. I got it, and I, I was like, oh, assume. God, I wasted $6. Yeah, but here's this guy that was like, this is exactly what I need. Like, he was so excited about it. So I was like, oh, my God, I can sell anything. <laughs> And so, yeah, you just get a sense of faith in yourself that it's something you can really do and that it's worth your time because ultimately it is cash money in your pocket. Yeah, and it's perfectly ethical. You know, it's not unethical either. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's business. This is what people do to you every day. Like those things that you pick up in the store, they're not as expensive as what you're paying for them. That store is a middleman from the manufacturer So they buy it from a manufacturer and then they up the price and then it comes to you where you pay a larger sum. 
you're basically doing the same thing, but you are getting the cash for you. Right, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I don't know. I seriously, I could talk about it all day, so if you have anything you ever want me to talk about, I will chat with you. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so crazy. So, like, you know, I'm, so I'm driving right now. Um, I just made it to yeah. Madison, but, like, you know how... Woo! I'm talking, we're always talking about like developing the eye where you, once you, once you develop, it's like a muscle. Once you develop the eye, you almost become like a money <laughs> magnet and you constantly yeah. see deals everywhere and opportunity. So as I'm driving, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of in the city now and I see all these lights and buildings and there's a mall over there. There's only one thing that immediately popped out at me and it's a Salvation Army thrift store, <laughs> tiny sign <laughs> from super far. And I'm like, oh, right away. I was like. I want to check that place out. <laughs> I'm not surprised. You would. You have like a beacon. I feel like your soul like calls out to the thrift stores and they're like, come to me. And here, here's the thing. When I started, I didn't have that beacon. But here's the thing. Once you develop and, and get that beacon, you go from making $200 maybe flipping something in a year to making over $20,000 in sales. So it's a real thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's no joke. I mean, it's a real, treat it like a real business and really invest in yourself and, and go out there and get as many deals as you can. It's all about volume and quantity. I think starting out and just uh, yeah. going through the motions as, as much as possible. But yeah, yeah. And, if, and it, it can be like, what? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it can be really fun too, because Weirdly enough, like some of my favorite nights or like times that we've hung out have been literally just going to pick up like different Craigslist things. So like you, you can totally do it on your own. Like you don't need a partner, but sometimes it's fun to have someone come along A for safety, but B because it ends up just being like a bonding experience where you kind of learn from each other and like you just kind of get into it and it's super cool and really fun. Yeah, for sure. I think when 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 our minds like come together, for sure, it it's super powerful as far as finding it's deals, electric. finding you know. It's yeah. what I said. It's electric. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, your your freaking furniture and vision insights that I I don't have, and you know, stuff like that. So. And you have things that I don't have that I'm like, I literally look at you in awe. Like, I'm so glad you're writing this book because it's stuff that you've taught me. And that's why I, I keep like trying to sneak peek it. I'm like, send me your audio file. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's, so it's, to it's going to be uh, done soon. So I'm looking forward to it. But anything else you want to add about uh, furniture, refinishing things, and that whole yeah. That yeah. Whole thing before um, we wrap it up? Yeah, so just, I guess, my, my key of the day, I'll give you that, is um, when you are looking at wood furniture and it has drawers, there, um, uh, there are something, I don't know how to explain it, but you open up the drawer and if you look at the side of it where the drawer face and the drawer comes together, there should be joints. They should be, they're called dovetail joints. And uh, when a furniture has dovetail joints, it means it's high quality furniture. So look up dovetail joints dovetail on Google. Joints. Okay. Yep, on Google, and then it'll show you a picture of what that looks like, and that is a good indication for you as someone who's looking at furniture when you open up a dresser to decide if that dresser was well made or if it's just a POS. Gotcha. And that's my tip of the day. That's for dressers and like like cabinets or desks and anything yeah. with drawers. With anything with drawers. So if it was like handmade or made by a good furniture maker, the drawers will be dovetailed because that means that it they're created a stronger joint because they want that furniture to last. So for instance, if you go to Ikea and you look at an Ikea dresser, that sucker is not going to be dovetailed. That was like on a factory line. They're mass producing it. They don't really care all that much about the integrity of the, um, like, or quality of that, that furniture piece. Mm -hmm. So, yep. So that's just a quality thing to know about furniture is that when you see dovetailed joints, you're looking at a well-made piece of furniture. Awesome tips. See, I didn't even know that, you know, and it's like yeah. certain like weird insights like that where I'm like, okay, I didn't even know of that world. Oh, it's a whole new world, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or I can give you another one is that 
uh, when you're looking at a piece of furniture, literally go up to it. Don't, don't don't just like look at it. Like get handsy. Like get real physical with it. Like open the drawers, see if they close properly, see if they open well, um, and then like, kind of shake it, like to to see if it is level. Because you don't want to have to get this piece of furniture and then it doesn't even sit level. Because people don't like that. They want their furniture to be you know ready to go. Right. So um, don't just do a visual. Like be like, I'm gonna get to know you, and then get in there and start touching it and opening things and see if you like how it functions as a, you know, as if it was yours. And then that helps a lot too. Okay. Yeah, that's a killer tip. Yep. So those, I guess I gave you two tips. You need, yeah. Now you, need you have to. to uh, you need to like write your own book on this, just on that whole, <laughs> that whole side of things. There's so much. Like, <laughs> I don't. I wonder if it, if they even have a book on like refinishing like to that detail you know to that extent I don't know probably not I'm sure there's like a Martha Stewart book I'm like sand this and then bake some cookies and then sand again but like awesome. maybe not like <laughs> but cool. yeah well yeah that's that's it that's it then that's it yeah <laughs> that's the way to end it right there cut <laughs> This has been the Flipping Ninja Podcast. From the crew at theflippingninja.com, we believe that all Americans should be able to make their own money without having to rely on a job. If you're ready to ditch the 9 to 5, visit theflippingninja.com and join our Flipping Ninja Blueprint Masterclass, where you'll discover how to earn a reliable side income of $1,000 to $5,000 a month flipping things with just 5 to 10 hours a week. See, we're on a mission to help 100,000 people earn $1,000 a month on the side flipping things. Working professionals, students, parents, men, women, artists, techies, entrepreneurs, introverts, total newbies, you name it. Be a part of the revolution and blast out of living paycheck to paycheck once and for all at www.theflippingninja.com. Until next time, remember, you're just one flip away from freedom. Want to make a difference? If you enjoyed today's show, please pay it forward and head over to iTunes. Give us a rating and leave a review so others just like you can benefit and take charge of their financial future.